Well, welcome to lecture 12, the second in our two lectures about genetics. And today we're going to be talking about behavior genetics. So in this lecture, I'm going to first talk about the birth of behavioral genetics and its ugly cousin, eugenics. We'll talk about the quest for heritability estimates. And then we're going to look at specific methods that behavioral geneticists have used to look at heritability, including family methods, adoption, and twin designs. And then we'll have a quick detour and an example of a twin design study. And then finally, we'll look at gene environment interactions and then how we can combine molecular and behavioral genetics in contemporary works on genomics. All right, let's start out with the birth of behavioral genetics and eugenics. And I left you um, the last lecture with this sort of overall uh, approach to how genetics kind of came to be in the 20th century and all these different uh, ingredients, including Mendel's inheritance methods and natural selection as it came from Darwin. And so when we put it all together now, we can kind of start talking about behavioral genetics. And one of the people that we need to credit for this is Francis Galton, who lived from 1822 to 1911. Galton was an amazing person in the sense that he accomplished a lot in his lifetime, invented a lot of things, contributed a lot of things. For example, here are just some of his accomplishments. He wrote over 340 papers and books. He developed regression and correlational methods with one of his uh, um, students. He also introduced the methods of using questionnaires and surveys in human research. He devised a method of fingerprinting for forensics. He developed the use of maps for meteorology, including isobars. He even invented the silent dog whistle. So those are just some of his many, many accomplishments. When he got into his middle-aged years, he started to uh, continue working in meteorology. But then around that time, his cousin, who happened to be Charles Darwin, published The Origin of Species. And as a result of reading that book and talking to his cousin, he became preoccupied with individual differences and inheritances of abilities. So basic questions about genetics. And so he really is the person who kind of developed behavioral genetics. He's the person who coined the phrase nature versus nurture that we use a lot in psychology. First mentioned this in English Men of Science, their nature and nurture, in which he tried to um, understand heredity and what made certain men of science so great. He even developed the twin method that we're going to talk about later in this lecture back in 1875, where he started to look at um, fraternal and or sorry, monozygotic and dizygotic twins. He even coined the term and the field eugenics in this book, Inquiries into Human Faculty and Its Development, in 1883. Let's talk more about eugenics now and, and also sort of the development of where all this was going in terms of behavioral genetics. And we have to also then mention his protege, Carl Pearson, who lived from 1857 to 1936. And you can see Pearson's on the left and there is the elder um, Galton on the right. Carl Pearson was a British mathematician and biostatistician. He founded the world's first statistics department at UCL in London in 1911. He was a protege of Galton, and he developed a correlation coefficient, R, the chi-square, the p-value, and perhaps even the first histogram, which you can see here. But like Galton, he was a eugenicist, and he and Galton were both promoters of this new field, which was this, the aim of which was to improve the genetic quality of the human population. And so he and Galton wrote essays warning of the dangers of inferior races and how civilization could be improved if feeble people weren't allowed to have offspring. Now, these now sound like abhorrent ideas in today's civilization, but in back in that time, he was very popular. And in fact, he was so popular that he was offered an OBE and a knighthood from the United Kingdom, both of which he turned down because he actually considered himself to be a socialist and a free thinker. So what's interesting about eugenics is as horrible as it sounds and how it was adopted later by the Nazis, for example, in World War II, is that both Pearson and Galton were sort of left-leaning people. They actually thought they were trying to improve society with these particular genetics. And therefore, you can see how Pearson considered himself to be even a socialist. Well, anyway, now you understand where eugenics comes from and, and the, baby, the birth of behavioral genetics. So look at the question now, what happens with behavioral genetics, putting aside the whole 
nasty business of eugenics. And basically what's going on is uh, in the original way that behavioral genetics was looked at was in terms of family resemblances for complex traits. So, you know, what traits, physical or psychological, run in families? That's really the kind of questions that um, behavioral geneticists look at. And why do these traits run in families? What is the etiology of their traits? And so they want to understand, um, is there something, you know, smaller parts, smaller bits that get passed on that combine up with other parts of the phenotype that might be involved in some trait? They want to know how genes and environments cause these traits, so they try to estimate the contributions of gene and environment. And they also want to estimate these genetic and environmental influences so they can study the role of genes in the environment more accurately. So there's a lot of statistics and quantification that goes on in behavioral genetics. genetics. So it's no wonder that so much of the statistics that we have in psychology that we use like in the first and second year at University of Queensland come from people doing work in behavioral genetics. All right, let's move on to point two, the quest for heritability estimates. And this is this difference, this distinction between an inherited trait versus what we call heritability. So when you normally hear about something being inherited, an inherited trait, that means that if the genes strongly influence average levels of a trait, we consider that trait to be strongly inherited. So if genes are really very strongly influencing height, for example, or the color of your eyes, then we say that on average, it looks like genes contribute to this and so it's a strongly inherited trait. Heritability, though, is a different question, whereas inherited traits have to do with the average level of the trait compared to like another species. Heritability is saying within a species, within a population, if the genes strongly influence the variability of that trait around the average level, then it's considered to have high heritability. So heritability has more to do with variance or variability around a mean. Okay, And so the example here that uh, we can give is, let's say, for example, you have a population of a thousand clones, okay? So you got these cloned people who all have exactly the same genetics. So you got a thousand of them. Now, if there's any variation in their phenotype, for example, maybe some of these thousand clones are exceptionally polite clones and everybody else is just normal in terms of their politeness, but you got some really polite clones, okay? Well, in that case, since they all have exactly the same genetics, every single one of the 1,000 clones has the same genetics, then we would have to say, that this trait of being polite isn't something that <coughs> isn't something that is really due to um, genetics. This variability about being polite is really 100% due to environment. So if it's 100% due to environment, the heritability estimate or the H squared would be 0% because it's all completely explained by something that's going on in the environment. Remember, it can't be genetics because all 1,000 of these clones have exactly the same genetics. Now, let's say you have a population of 1,000 people. Um, these times they're not clones, but they have exactly the same environment. All right, so that means that they all have the same environment. They were raised the same way. Everything's the same, identical in their environment. So if there is any variation, for example, some of these people in this, in this population of 1,000 are more aggressive then we could say it's not an effect of the environment because everybody has the same environment. And that would mean that the H2, the, H, the heritability index is 100%. So it's all due to genetics if there are some people who are more aggressive. So one thing you can gather from that, and it's also a point that Sapolsky makes a lot in chapter eight, is that to really understand the heritability of some behavior, it has to be looked at across many different environments. Because if exactly the same environment is the same for everybody, um, well, the problem is it's going to possibly inflate your H2, your heritability, right? If you can show that something, um, this variation happens, but it's not due to the environment, despite the fact there's lots of different environments, then you could feel more comfortable estimating what the heritability is. So to really understand heritability, you really have to look at it across different environments. All right. Now, what behavioral genetics have done, and geneticists have done, is tried to estimate heritability using different methods. And the three most common methods that were used in the 20th century would have been family methods, adoption, and twin designs. So family studies are kind of like that pedigree chart that I showed you at the end of the last lecture. What they do is they try to establish family resemblance or familiarity to kind of show in the pedigree charts whether or not certain traits are being passed down and to whom.
Adoption designs are more of an experiment of nurture because what's happening is there is you're going to have somebody who has a biological connection to their parent, but they're raised in a completely different environment. So you could then argue that the adoption design lets you look at the environment or the nurture aspect of it. Whereas a twin design, where you compare like monozygotic and dizygotic twins to each other, um, is there more of an experiment of nature, where we can look at more at how exactly the um, the genes might be contributing to whatever the trait is that you're interested in. So let's look at these one at a time. We'll look at family studies first. Now, family studies are the oldest method, but twin studies, remember, are also around during the time of Galton. He's the one that introduced them. Now, family studies, what they do is they try to establish a family resemblance for some trait or disorder. And so, like I said, they're trying to establish familiarity. How much does this actually travel through families? It's, it's a way of kind of looking at um, whether or not it's an inherited trait, because familiarity lets you see if things are being inherited or not. Or you could also look at the family resemblance for two or more traits or disorders, and then this would be called co-familiarity when you look at how two or more traits um, seem to be passed down in a family resemblance. So a simple concept, you basically have family members show a family member show greater resemblance for a disorder or trait than do unrelated individuals, if it's really something that could be um, described as being uh, something that's being inherited. Um, the simplest design is to contrast the rates of a disorder, for example, and the relatives of affective individuals with people who are rates in places where they're unaffected. We have unaffected controls. And when you have a more complex design, you could contrast the rates of a disorder or some trait in the relatives of affected individuals with rates in the relatives of individuals affected with a different disorder altogether. So that kind of just shows you the basic logic behind family study designs. And like I said, they kind of follow those pedigree charts that I talked about at the last lecture. Here's an example, for instance, of schizophrenia, where they're looking at how um, schizophrenia is, goes with relatedness in terms of similarity. And you can see that the more distinct or different you are from a particular relative in a bloodline, the less likely it is that you have schizophrenia too, if you um, are talking about who has it. So like in the middle of this chart, you can see the index case would be somebody who has schizophrenia. Their identical twin would be, uh, if they had uh, also had it, would be 100% matching, right? Because they have exactly the same genetics. Their fathers would only have 50% of their genes. Their grandfathers would only have 25% of the genes. So if you looked at how schizophrenia passed along each of those different places down to the sons, the grandsons, the great-grandsons, you'd expect that because schizophrenia, um, whatever the traits are, a fewer percentage of traits are being passed down with each of those more distant relations, then you're not going to necessarily see the same incidence of schizophrenia. So though the, each individual gene follows like these Mendelian laws of inheritance, traits like schizophrenia are probably actually influenced by many, many genes, which result in these traits being more quantitative rather than just having like simple little pictures with green and red circles and whether or not this is dominant and this is recessive. When we're talking about complex things like schizophrenia or aggression, um, you can expect then you're going to have to do more quantify, quantifying of for instance, variability and so on, in order to understand the genetic relatedness and how it's going to contribute to whatever that trait is. So um, family, there's other ways you can look at this, by the way. You can look at family history versus family study methods. Um, the difficulties and disadvantages are if you're looking at the family history um, in terms of like the validity of the diagnostic status and relatives. So if you actually do have a pedigree chart and you kind of look back a few different generations in the family history, the problem with that is that maybe uh, 50, 100 years ago, they had a different way of diagnosing or measuring that particular trait. So it, you, the validity might be more problematic. The results themselves may depend on family size and structure. And of course, over different generations, you have different sizes of families, different kinds of structures. Um, it's also hard to assess the older generations because the diagnosis may not mean the same thing or be as valid across different ages. And it's expensive and difficult to implement when you look across different generations like this. Finally, the other problem with doing it this way is it's hard to disentangle genes from the environment. Um, so whether you're doing family history or you're looking at a family just now, we're all alive, and you're looking at cousins and so on, these methods are very difficult to disentangle the genes from the environment. All you really can do is just try to tell whether or not something, a trait, might be inherited. All right, the next kind of uh, method that uh, behavioral geneticists have used has been adoption studies. 
And the purpose here is that ado adoption studies are an experiment of nurture because they provide the most direct estimates of like shared environmental influences. They can also provide estimates of genetic influences or heritability. So um, the design in which genetic environmental contributions to a trait or disease are cleaved, it's like I said, an experiment of nurture as well as nature. Um, inferences regarding the genetic influences come from the correlation between anything between the biological parents and their adoptees. Um, the difference in the correlation between adopted parents and their biologically related versus adopted children and differences in the correlation between biologically related and adoptive siblings. So why I put all that up here, and I'm going to continue to show some other slides like this, is just to show you that um, I don't want you necessarily to remember every single one of these things about how you would actually make such inferences, but I'm trying to show you statistically how quantitatively they kind of try to uh, dissect or figure out which parts are more genetic influences and which things are going to be more environmental influences. So all of these different correlation coefficients go into understanding genetic influences. You can also look at environmental influences by looking at the correlation between the adoptive parents and the adoptees, the correlations between the traits between adoptive siblings, correlations and traits between adoptees and their adoptive parents versus their biological parents. And then one may get different estimates of genetic and environmental influences from parent offspring versus sibling correlations. So this is a type of family study, except that someone's been adopted out and now you can kind of look at whether or not this trait is more due to some environmental commonality or is it something that's more biological, it's more genetic, right? So both of these methods, both of these questions can be estimated from looking at all these correlations between each of those different uh, people. And then the third method is the twin studies and twin designs are like an experiment of nature as well as nurture. Um, so what you want to do in, in a twin study is look at the differences between monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And you might think that's a fairly easy thing to do, but it turns out that in order to, um, if you're a researcher who's going to do a twin study and you say, someone contacts you and says, I got a pair of twins, they would like to participate in our study. Um, well, what you'd want to do is assess whether or not they really are monozygotic and dizygotic without actually having to take genetics from them, take their DNA sample and try to do some sort of um, analysis to determine whether or not they're monozygotic and dizygotic. So they have these kind of screener questions that they give to people to try to figure out if they're monozygotic or dizygotic. So it's not as easy as you might think to determine whether or not twins are monozygotic and dizygotic. So you might ask things like, in their physical appearance, are your twins as like as two peas in a pod or not as like as two peas in a pod? Do your twins have the same eye color or do they have different eye color? So you can see that answers to these questions might help you understand more whether or not you're dealing with twins who are dizygotic versus monozygotic. Um, interesting little fact about this is that, you know, that first question about whether or not their, your twins are alike as two peas in a pod. That's what a question that they might ask in the U.S. In Sweden, what they might ask in Swedish is, in their physical appearances, are your twins as alike as two berries on a bush? Or in the Netherlands, they use the question, in their physical appearance, are your twins as alike as two drops of rain? So these are the kinds of items that you would just give out in questionnaires to help you figure out whether or not the twins to be studied are monozygotic and dizygotic. All right, so the design in these twin studies is which... Genetic environmental influences on a trait or disease are estimated by contrasting the similarity of the monozygotic and the dizygotic twins. Because again, the monozygotic twins have 100% shared genetics, right? They have exactly the same twins. They're like clones of each other. The dizygotic twins are only going to have 50% sharing. They're like any other sibling. They don't actually have 100% uh, shared of their, of their um, genetics. Now, a common misconception is that the twins need to be reared apart, but actually twins reared together are just as useful for many other purposes. It's that you'll see, for instance, that um, in Sapolsky, he talks a little bit about some research that was done by Tom Bouchard, where he was able to get these twins that have been reared apart. And they're really very fascinating to look at because then you can further disentangle things like environment and genetics from one another. But it's not the case that in most of these twin studies, they're, they're twins that are reared apart. So how would you make any inferences about genetic influences? Well, you would look at the difference in correlation on some trait like schizophrenia or aggression or helpfulness, right? And look to see what the difference is in, in correlation between monozygotic and dizygotic twins.
The correlation between monozygotic twins reared apart, if you actually have that, is a possibility, like Bouchard does. Um, or you can look at the difference in the correlation between reared apart monozygotics and dizygotics. So these are all ways that you could estimate heritability. Um, inferences regarding shared environmental inferences would come from, influences would come from like the difference in the R between the monozygotic and the dizygotic, specifically the degree to which the dizygotic twin R is greater than half the monozygotic, monozygotic twin R. And inferences regarding non-shared environmental influences would come from differences in the mysogonic twin R from the number one. So these are, again, I don't want you to memorize exactly how they make all these inferences. I'm really just trying to fill in the gaps here. So you can kind of see that if you are a person doing twin research, you would actually do a lot of quantification to come up with these estimates. You'd have to measure this with these correlations and then try to figure out from the variability what the estimate is of heritability. Okay. So twin studies have been sort of the gold standard for much of the last half of the 20th century up until the 21st century. But even the twin studies these days are, are, are actually having some problems. Now you'll see that in Sapolsky on pages 237 to 240, he does have some criticisms of twin and adoption studies. He's, like I said, kind of gold standard studies in trying to understand behavioral genetics. Um, for, for example, one of the criticisms are that monozygotic and dizygotic twins don't really share environments equally. So the whole point, the reason why they liked looking at monozygotic and dizygotic, they would say, well, both, both pairs of twins, monozygotic and dizygotic, were in the womb at the same time, right? They were born at the same time. They've been raised at the same time. They have identical environments. But the problem with that, the criticism is that monozygotic twins are actually treated more similarly than dizygotic twins. You've probably seen this phenomenon where parents will go ahead and take their monozygotic twins and dress them exactly the same. They don't do this as much with dizygotic twins. Monozygotic twins also experience life more similarly as fetuses because it turns out they often will share the placenta. So they've actually had much more similar inputs from the mother when they were a fetus compared to zygotic twins. So, and as we talked about in the last couple lectures, a lot about fetal development, that so much of that kind of common experience, the things that would happen as they were developing fetuses, because they share that common placenta, that maybe that would be the reason why um, you could say that they don't really actually have the same sort of shared environment that dizygotic twins would have. In adoption studies, the child is adopted soon after birth, but what about the prenatal environmental effects? So what they like to do is say, okay, look, this child was adopted at birth. It's gone off and lived with its new adoptive parents. So now we can go ahead and look at effects of the environment in this new family, compare it to the genetics of the kids that stayed with their biological parents. But the problem is that one of the things about adopted kids is they did have that prenatal environmental effect with their biological parent. So it could be that the way that the parent ate, the way the parent dealt with stress, got passed on in terms of fetal development. And so therefore you can't just say that that child has exactly the same genetics, but a completely different environment because they were adopted differently. They did have a very important part of their environment that was shared with their parent. Adoption studies also assume parents and children don't share any genes, right? So a child gets adopted away to another family. Um, but a lot of these um, adoption agencies will try to match people with similar racial or ethnic backgrounds. And because of that, that would mean then that already because of sort of ancestry, um, there are a lot of shared genes there that you would have. It's not just some random person that they go with. They kind of go with somebody who actually has a lot more similar genetics to them. And so it could be, again, that adoption studies really aren't doing a very good job then of separating environment from genetics. And adoptive parents finally tend to be more educated, wealthier, and psychiatrically healthier than the typical biological parent. And so because of that, you'd get these range restriction effects, basically because the environment is more homogenous among people who are adoptive parents because they tend to be um, less variable in their environments because they're more educated, wealthier, and psychiatrically healthier. And then that would actually produce then a higher H2 because of it, a higher estimate. So these are all criticisms of that traditional way of doing um, behavioral genetics research. I want to go ahead and just make a quick detour and let you know that at 
Brisbane, here in Brisbane, where um, the University of Queensland is, Brisbane is actually home to one of the largest research groups in behavioral genetics in the world. It's over at the Queensland Institute of Medical Research, Berghofer, which is a research institute that's independent from our university, but a lot of the staff there have joint appointments with staff in psychology and in psychiatry at UQ. And some of the big people that are over there include professors Nick Martin, who really was one of the early pioneers in twins research, um, has created these massive data sets um, in Australia and around the world in which um, lots and lots of people have contributed their DNA. You have Sarah Medlin, who does a lot of work on psychiatric genetics, trying to understand psychiatric disorders through genetic methods. And Eski Dirks, uh, who does translational neurogenomics, where basically they're trying to understand how the genome and the nervous system kind of go together, so where you get the, like the union of neuroscience with genetics. Now, if you were ever interested in the future to try to, to work with these people, you can actually do a PhD with them and then enroll simultaneously, um, like at UQ Psychology, while you're working on your thesis. So QIMR doesn't actually have the ability to grant PhDs, so a lot of their students do their PhD somewhere else, like at UQ, and then while they're getting their thesis done and being directed by these people, they will have a UQ-branded PhD thesis while they worked and did their research and learned these methods at QIMR. So we're very lucky. I've actually met some of these people. I've had some people coming in and out of town. Um, it's kind of an exciting place, um, and it's very famous for the research that they've done. So let's take an example of the kind of stuff that maybe, for instance, Nick Martin would have done. And he's been doing this for many decades now. Um, this is actually not something that Nick Martin is an author on. Um, in fact, the paper here was published in 1993. Tesser, who's the author here, Abraham Tesser, was a social psychologist, or he, I should say he is a social psychologist. Um, and he used data from Nick Martin's twin studies. Um, a couple different studies here, but I'm going to tell you about the one with 3,000 pairs. So already in 1986, Nick Martin was publishing papers. We had 3,000 pairs of twins um, in which they had measured a bunch of traits in these twins. Um, and they didn't actually do, I think some of them provided DNA samples, but that wasn't really the point back then. You would just actually be more interested in... Um, measuring traits, having them do behaviors, fill out questionnaires, that kind of thing, and then look at monozygotic and dizygotic twin pairs and try to, under, try to estimate um, the heritability of different traits. And so what Tesser did is he got access to this data set and he looked at the heritability of different attitudes. Attitudes is a construct in social psychology that has to do with you know, your opinion about something, how much you agree or disagree with a particular item or a politician or something. And what happened was in a Nick Martin study, they had measured a, several of these attitudes and then looked at how heritable they were. And what Tesser found, or was reporting in this paper, is that basically the higher the heritability of that attitude based on that twin research, the more resistant it was for people in America, who were just a college sample of not twins, to change their attitude. So again, the logic here is he goes and looks at Nick Martin's twin studies, figures out what the heritability is of different attitudes based on these estimates from the twin studies that Martin and his colleagues had done. And then knowing what the heritability was, he went ahead and presented these attitudes in experiments to students at the University of Georgia in the United States. And he basically found that the more heritable the attitude seemed to be from the twin studies, the harder it was to change that attitude in the laboratory. Just to give you an idea of some of these um, sort of highly heritable attitudes. You can see attitudes towards the death penalty, towards jazz, I don't know why that's there, uh, towards the royalty, apartheid, censorship, white superiority, divorce, military drills, working mothers, nudist camps, women judges. I mean, these are all over the place. You can see that the original um, bunch of attitude items were actually from a 1968 inventory, so there's a little bit of a strange sort of thing going there. But that second column that you can see that says H, that's the heritability estimate. So the higher the number, the more that this variation that you see in the population, or the more the variance that you see among people who vary in terms of their attitudes towards the death penalty, um, that variability is better accounted for by genetics. That's why it has a higher heritability. Um, things like your attitudes towards co-education, which mean women and boys and girls studying together at school, or your attitude towards straitjackets, that didn't seem to be very heritable. So this is older, older research. 
but it kind of shows you this really kind of interesting thing you could do once you know heritability to see if the actual behavior or this trait that's highly heritable or not very heritable based on this twin research of Martin and others um, is actually flexible or something that seems to be sort of like stuck in you because it's a genetic um, action. By the way, I should just also mention, you know, you see all these uh, different attitudes, and I'm not trying to say that you have genes that actually determine your attitude towards the death penalty or jazz or royalty or whatever. You got to think back to the previous lecture where we tried to say that genes actually probably determine different biological systems in us, and then combinations of these different biological systems come together to create traits. So, for example, maybe your um, maybe you're somebody who's more interested in aggression or retribution, and maybe that is um, because you have attitudes around that. Maybe you have biological systems that make you have a propensity to be more aggressive or more punitive, and then the genetics would actually be what creates those biological changes. And of course, in the environment, it's going to have a huge impact on all this as well. Now, while we're on the environment, let's move to our fifth point, gene-environment interactions. All right. Now, this is an interesting section in Sapolsky's chapter where he says things like, and someone asks you, what are the effects of the gene on some behavior? Your answer should always be, it depends on the environment. That means that there's a gene environment interaction. So if a gene is different in different environments, has different effects, then we have a gene environment interaction. And it turns out that gene environment interactions are all over the place. They're quite common that we are now seeing that our genes frequently do different things in different environments. This makes sense given what I said in the previous lecture that transcription factors are regulated by the environment, right? So whether or not we express a gene is going to be determined by the environment. And so the environment has a huge input on whether or not a gene is expressed and whether or not we're actually going to see the trait. And some are quite powerful. A gene may do just the opposite thing in two different environments. An example that's in Sapolsky is how 5-HTT codes for a transporter that, transporter that removes serotonin from the synapse after it's been released. But one variant of the 5-HTT increases the risk for depression. It interferes with the transportation of the serotonin. Now, the thing about this, it increases the risk for depression only if the person has experienced childhood trauma. So there's the environmental part of it. So if you have this variant, but you don't ever experience childhood trauma, you're not gonna find that you're at risk for depression. So it only interacts or only seems to be a function if you've experienced childhood trauma. So this kind of gene environment interaction, like I said, quite ubiquitous, happens all over the place. And it tells us then again that genes are not so deterministic as you might have thought. That genes really are something that is always going to be talked about in terms of its context, in terms of its environment. All right, let's move on to the final part of this lecture, which is to combine molecular and behavioral genetics. So the last lecture was about molecular. This one's been about behavioral genetics. Let's just review quickly that the major methods that you could find in behavioral genetics, the traditional way was the twin adoption and family studies. And we've talked about the pluses and the minuses of doing those different kinds of studies. But now in 2022, in the 2020s, whatever you wanna say, contemporary behavioral geneticists focus much more on genomics, on the whole genome. And as a result, they're not as, as, as um, focused on twin adoption family studies anymore. They typically, though, are going to require very large sample sizes to look at genomics. And one common thing they do, and this is something I mentioned at the second lecture when we were talking about different social neuroscience methods, is to look at candidate genes. And this is where they have some belief about, from some theory, about a gene having a particular phenotype. Like, for instance, it's involved in serotonin transporter, right? And so the, the problem is that they're then going to look in, and see if people who have that particular allele, that variant of that gene, um, also show that particular phenotype. These are really hard studies to do. They're often really difficult to replicate because of the fact that probably a lot, of, a lot of our phenotypes, a lot of our behaviors, are actually determined by multiple genes. And again, depending on what the environment is. So candidate genes haven't been as successful as you might think they would have been. 
So that's led to a lot of these behavioral geneticists to turn to GWAS studies, genome-wide association studies. And what they're looking at is the relationship of millions of different polymorphisms that um, could occur as a result of all the different combinations of the alleles and see how they might be associated with particular phenotypes. So they're not theoretically determined, and as Sapolsky calls it, they're more like fishing expeditions because you don't have a priori ideas about necessarily about where to look, okay? So you're gonna throw the entire human genome in there, look for all the different variations across thousands and thousands of people and see if it, that those variations correlate with a particular phenotype that you're interested in. And the thing that they often will be focusing a lot more on is what are called SNPs. These are um, small, um, differences that you might find a specific position where you find a small number of people have a, a variation at some location in the human genome. And so you try to find if other people have a small variation, these small differences in their SNPs, would we see that they all, those people who share that particular variation show um, some sort of relationship between that variation and the phenotype of interest. And because there are over a million SNPs in the human genome, that means then you've got a lot of fishing to do just to look at just little SNPs all over the place to see if people who have a particular variant um, and that SNP um, have a particular phenotype. And so um, again, it's like a big fishing expedition. Now, um, I think Sapolsky is fairly negative near the end of this chapter about the whole GWAS approach, saying like, look how little we actually learn. I think it's sort of exciting right now to think about GWAS studies and to look at this entire genomic approach. Um, it's sort of like we're, I would say we're sort of like in near the beginning of the whole thing where lots of cute, really amazing, um, I think amazing discoveries are still about to happen, especially when we think about it in terms of social behavior. I'll just give you an example of a, a study that was published from um, a, one of my colleagues at the University of Queensland, Brendan Zeech, and you can see here he's got lots of co-authors there. Um, and what Brendan did, he's got this paper just published in September of 2021 in Nature Human Behavior. Uh, Genomic evidence consistent with antagonistic pleiotropy may explain the evolutionary maintenance of same-sex sexual behavior in humans. Now let's try to break this down a little bit, but if you're really interested, I'm going to put the article up on Blackboard so you can read it. Um, but human same-sex sexual behavior, this is in the, um, in the abstract, so basically homosexual behavior, is heritable. It confers, though, no immediately obvious direct reproductive or survival benefit and can divert mating efforts from reproductive opportunities. And this presents a Darwinian paradox. Why has same-sex behavior been maintained despite the apparent selection against it? So he's saying, like, why would we have this particular trait, why this phenotype where people um, seek out same-sex sexual behavior it doesn't actually help propagate the species. Well, they say, we show that genetic effects associated with SSB may, in individuals who only engage in opposite sexual behavior, what they call OSB individuals, it confers them a mating advantage. So they're saying that the common genetics that might underlie SSB, that if you're somebody who's OSB and you have that same sort of genetic profile, it could confer a mating advantage. And so using results from a recent genome-wide association study of SSB and a new genome-wide association study on the number of opposite sex sexual partners in 358,426 individuals, we show that among the OSB individuals, genetic effects associated with SSB are associated with having more opposite sex sexual partners. So they're saying these same genetic effects that you find in same sexual behavior people if you have those and you're opposite sex um, oriented, that those people are gonna have more sexual partners. And so therefore, if they have more sexual partners, they're gonna be more likely to uh, propagate the species, right? So they use this data from the UQ Biobank, which is a huge data set in which 500,000 people born between 1934 and 1971 were recruited in the UK in 2006 and 2010. And all these participants, what they did is they provided DNA samples so you could go ahead and do all of the genetic analysis that you wanted. And they also completed extensive questionnaire data, including questions related to sexual behavior. And in this particular paper by Zeech et al., they also used uh, samples from the US, um, samples from the 23andMe data set, and from Ad Health. It's, pub it's funded by NIMH. Um, they also got DNA and questionnaire data, and this gave them another 5,000 people to look at in their data set. So what they ended up doing is running a GWAS for um, opposite sexual par par partners in both men and women. 
Um, and then in aggregate, they looked at all the available SNPs that you could get, and they found that, that the variation in how much um, the number of opposite sex sexual partners people had, about 7% of the variation was accounted for in the SNPs for women, and about 9% of it was accounted for in the men. And then they say for SSB, the SNP-based heritability was estimated at 8 to 25%, where the range reflects differing estimates using different methods. For both variables, this NSP heritability was not driven by a small, num by a small number of genes of large effect, but rather a very large number of genes of very small effect spread across the genome. So this is trying to say again that just sort of like schizophrenia, but maybe even more so, that other sex behavior, opposite sex behavior, or same sex behavior, um, the genetic basis of it seems to be a very large number of genes that are contributing to it that are spread across the genome. Now they try to figure out and try to drill down a little bit in their data analyses to figure out what it is that might be sort of like, you remember how I said that genetics can create biological systems and the biological systems can go ahead and create different traits? Well, the traits that they kind of looked at here to see if it might be correlated with um, SSB and with the OSB individuals in terms of their genetic profiles was openness to experience and risk-taking behavior. And what you can see here, I've marked them all in red, are the correlations, the simple R correlations. We can see that the um, correlation, if you have that pattern of SSB where you're more likely to have um, to have same-sex partners, or in, this, in the case of people who are other sex um, uh, behavior people that they like to have other like to have other opposite sex partners. Um, you can see that there's correlations there with the um, trait of openness to experience, which basically is one of those big five personality traits that has to do with the fact that you're open to new and different experiences. Risk taking behavior is also correlated with these profiles. So you can see that maybe perhaps people who are more likely to take same sex partners or to go ahead and have opposite sex partners are people who are higher in risk taking. And so perhaps what's going on with all those many, many genes that are contributing to the profile of, of these kinds of people is that it has more to do with things like risk-taking or openness to experience, and that might be what underlies it. But again, this is again a, a point that Sapolsky also makes again at the end of his chapter. It's pretty tiny little effects that we're talking about that require very large samples, and it looks like many, many, many genes are involved. And... We're still, like I said, I think in the infancy, although I think this is very exciting research that kind of points the way towards more interesting research ahead. All right, so in this lecture, we've talked about the birth of behavioral genetics and its ugly cousin eugenics. We talked about heritability estimates and the quest for those, how in behavioral genetics for much of the 20th century, they used family adoption and twin designs to try to estimate heritability. We had a quick detour to look at the QIMR group of people who do genetics there and looked at that Tesser study. We talked about gene environment interactions. And finally, um, I talked about how we can combine molecular and behavioral genetics in the contemporary way that this research is done. All right, so that ends the genetics portion of this course. What we have on next is to talk about culture and then we'll talk about evolution. Once we cover those two topics, you basically have all the different levels of analysis for social behavior that we want to cover in social neuroscience. So once we get done with culture and the environment, I'm sorry, culture and evolution, then we can start focusing on specific topics of social behavior and take that multiple levels of analysis then to each of those different topics. So thank you very much.